Thank you. Uh, it's so good to be here and to be with Latrice Clark, soon to be, I think, Dr. Latrice Clark, quickly in our day, uh, um, who is the co-executive director for the Truth Telling Project and the coordinator for the Grassroots Reparation Campaign. Latrice will tell you um, about the history um, of the campaign. I just wanna say what a joy it's been to work uh, with Latrice and to experience um, her dedication, brilliance, her capacity to teach, um, to carry uh, the stories of positive uh, examples of reparations and to envision how the movement can be carried further. So Latrice, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be on the organizing team with you um, at the Grassroots uh, Reparations Campaign. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to work with you as well. Lynn. I had so much to learn. I always say her brilliance. Uh, such a pleasure to be able to be here with you all tonight as well. So I am aware of time. I will try to get as much as I can out um, as succinctly as possible so that we can all move on with our evenings. But um, as she shared, I'm the co-executive director of the Truth Telling Project. And if you're unfamiliar with the Truth Telling Project, basically it was a community response and outrage to the killing of Mike Brown Jr. in Ferguson, Missouri, um, which at the time was sort of that epicenter to address the police race, violence and racial and systemic injustices. Um, which we have seen you know, throughout the country with the killing of George Floyd, Sandra Bland, Breonna Taylor, and so many others. Um, and so one of the things that we did with the Truth Telling Project um, is sort of hold a reconciliation, truth telling and reconciliation panel. And that allowed the victims of police violence and their families to be able to come forth in the community and tell their stories, right? It's an opportunity them to experience um, healing and, and sort of um, being in solidarity with one another. So what we're talking about when we're talking about decarceration and um, you know, reparations, we're, we're sort of looking at addressing those carceral settings, meaning both the places and spaces um, that sort of hold symbolic and material link linkages to various mechanisms of so social control. So that maintain and seek to reproduce white supremacy. So we're not just talking about the criminal justice and legal systems, right? Such as prisons, um, you know, the police, militarism and surveillance, but we're also talking about, you know, within our schools with the prison industrial complex, right? How black and brown children are often seen um, as being treated far worse, right? They're, they're expelled at a much larger rate um, and they're sort of put into that pipeline to, and set up for incarceration. Um, within healthcare settings with black women um, and their maternal health, so, you know, mortality rate is much being higher, two to three times higher than their counterpart, right? And not being heard by their physicians with their ailments. Um, and we're also sort of talking about, you know, issues surrounding um, the well with welfare, right? The sort of stereotype that it's primarily black and brown people who are recipients when indeed it's actually um, primarily white women. And so these systems use physical and ideological violence and oppression to enable these manifestations of carcerality within and throughout our society. So these are some of the structures um, that are limiting um, our ability to be able to uh, move forward with systemic racism, right? And, and being able to sort of heal racially. So the grassroots reparations campaign is a, pro a program of the Truth Telling Project and sort of seeks a partner with faith-based and ethically centered organizations, right? To create and build that culture of reparations. So you can't have reparations without truth telling, right? One of the things that um, our Reverend uh, James sort of talked about is having critical race theory. You know, we're having this Juneteenth holiday being passed as a federal holiday, but we're gonna have individuals who are not gonna know what that holiday means. So you need to be able to acknowledge the truth, right? Being able to sort of tell the truth in order for there to be reparations. And so we believe the midpoint between truth and reconciliation is reparations. And oftentimes when it comes to that conversation about reparations brought forth in this country, we only sort of look at the, the economic benefit. 
And yes, that is a piece of it. However, reparations is more than just writing a check, right? It's about personal accountability. Um, I can write you a check for whatever money, but that does not require me to embody. It does not require me to have a moral obligation to um, change my behavior and act actively try to change the systems that are allowing my brothers and sisters to be oppressed. So although economic equity is necessary for full repair, it does not speak to the acknowledgement of past harms and it does not um, sort of speak to how the way that still impacts us in the present, right? It does not speak to that accountability. So what we are looking to do and aim to achieve through our efforts is sort of that complete removal um, of all carceral systems through our abolitionist frameworks, while also advocating for decolonial, restorative and reparative alternatives for addressing social injustice. So we say in our, the grassroots reparations campaign that reparationist is the new abolitionist for our campaign, right? We're advocating for accountability, um, for reparations being a deeply embodied spiritual practice, right? We're calling on faith-based and ethically centered uh, communities to join us in the fight for reparations and holding themselves responsible for their role, right? For their complicity in the past harms of this country from the slave Bible and omitting passages of freedom within um, the teachings that were given to slaves to profiting and staying silent about um, institutions of oppressions and the ways that it's being able to um, maintain systemic racism. And I think that's sort of what was also talked about previously is where, where is the black churches, how are we showing up? So one of the things that we do is that we uphold the UN's five articles of reparations that demonstrate the need to, uh, what's needed to reach full reparations, right? One of them being restitution, right? Restoring a victim's rights, pro property, uh, full citizenship status. And with the Black Lives Matter movement, this involves recognizing our free humanity, right? One of the reasons why we're able to be killed and place officers not being held accountable is that we're not being seen fully as human, right? Our humanity is not being recognized within the dominant culture. Um, rehabilitation, so psychological and physical support, right? We have individuals that have experienced trauma, there are generations of trauma. So being able to um, rehabilitate and work with these individuals who are impacted by these um, past and present harm. Compensation. And that compensation can mean a myriad of things, right? It's not only the economic, like we said, it's not just about cutting a check, but allowing communities that are most impacted to lead these efforts, right? Supporting black led organization, what it looks like, what they need without any expectations on how the funds or land or any other form of support should be used. Um, satisfaction, right? That's going back to that acknowledgement of guilt apology, right, burials, construction of memorials, all of these things are important in order to heal and move past um, these racial injustices. And then finally, guarantees of non-repeat, reformation of laws and civil and political structures that, that led to and still fuel oppression and violence, systemic violence. So reparations can be seen as a decolonial, spiritual, political, and social intervention. So one of the things that I want to share with you all is because I'm based here in the city of Chicago, just a story from my local area of um, what folk reparations kind of look like using the example of the Chicago Justice Torture System uh, Center. So the story of the Chicago Justice Center sort of begins with the former uh, Chicago Police Department commander, John Burge, who was a Vietnam War veteran. And while serving as the commander, he, along with officers under his command, intentionally targeted communities of color, and they kidnapped and tortured over 120 individuals to produce confessions to crimes they did not commit, specifically within the South and West Side of communities within Chicago. They used torture interrogation tactics that they learned from Operation Phoenix, right? That included racial epithets, electric shock, suffocation, brutal beatings um, at, in order to being forced into giving these false, false confessions. So the survivors of the torture spent years and some even decades um, incarcerated behind bars. And as of 2016, 20 of the torture survivors have been released from prison and or exonerated on the basis of their innocence. However, other victims are still serving their sentence present day and are continuing um, to suffer that sort of stigma of wrongful convictions. At least 20 individuals remain incarcerated still as a result, um, based whole or in part on these forced confessions and are denied routinely evidentiary hearings about 
um, legal evidence of the torture in order to get those convictions overturned. And neither Commander Burge nor any of the officers under his, com his command that were doing this torture were ever criminally charged. Um, Burge was convicted of perjury in 2010 and sentenced to four years of prison and got out in three. And the Illinois Supreme Court was uh, ruled that he was still allowed to collect his $54,000 a year pension during the time that he was still serving in prison, which for many of the black and brown folks behind bars, um, their options are limited when it comes to what they're able to do once they um, are, get out of the penal system. So um, in 2014 is sort of when the campaign began to fight in, for this ordinance for them to the torture survivors um, for, of Burge and it was stalled in the Chicago City Council from the previous year of 2013. And so some of the things that they were fighting for within that ordinance was just having the convictions overturned, right? Having the uh, organizers sort of sit before the UN's Committee Against Torture and recommending that the US government and um, sort of the city as well, bring Burge and those accompanying perpetrators to justice, right? Which ended up leading to his conviction of perjury and obstruction of justice. So it wasn't until um, 2015 that the Chicago City Council unanimously passed a reparations ordinance for Burge police torture survivors and their families, but this was happening over a 30 year period. Um, and so it, it was a long time coming for them. It, it, from 1990s early on to 2015, here we are finally getting services and things for these families, their survivors of this torture. So what that sort of looked like for these families, it allowed education on police torture in public schools. Some of the survivors are able to sort of develop those public speaking skills and receive offers to tell their stories. Um, in, in the Chicago public schools, a formal apology from the Chicago City Council. Um, we talked about the importance of acknowledgement free college education for survivors and their families, um, $5.5 million in financial compensation. They're currently working on a building a public memorial dedicated to those torture survivors and receiving the counseling services that they needed um, that were wholly absent during the time that these uh, survivors were sort of fighting to get this ordinance passed. So, um, most of them are still continuing to suffer that psychological effects of the torture that they endured and have been without resources, um, including that financial compensation up until prior to the passage of that legislation. And while this ordinance is one step in repairing the wrongs committed by the Chicago Police Department against the torture survivors and their respective communities, that sort of work of, of realizing the healing and transformation um, that this sort of lays out, is to, it still continues today, right? And there have been other instances that we have seen uh, of local, um, like the city of Evanston who do donated $400,000 to set up access to affordable housing in their city and Asheville, North Carolina, and many others who are sort of locally trying to mimic what it could look like to offer reparations um, on the community level. So when it comes to incarceration, there's often that sort of gut reaction to think in terms of punishment rather than restorative reparative practices, right? Punishment is often, you know, the current basis of our penal system and has created and contributed to that inhumane and unjust institution. Not only have those that have been uh, incarcerated or subjected to forced label, uh, non livable wages, right? With the forest fires in California, a lot of them were on the front lines for that, right? We have corporations that are sort of contracting the forced labor of uh, prisoners and, and, and not really paying them a lay, uh, living wage for that. So once you are convicted, you're subjected to policies and practices that make it nearly impossible for you to become a fully functioning member within society. And some of those collateral consequences of incarceration include, you know, your right being um, to vote being impacted, right? Access to affordable housing. Um, one of the peculiar institutions of, um, you know, how, uh, ostracizing of, of Black people and criminalization of our skin has been the creation of the ghetto, right? Urbanization, um, poverty kills, like Dr. Uh, Reverend James said. And so having access to quality education and financial aid is impacted, right? Being denied um, uh, employment options, um, and is, as well as just adjusting socially and having a certain level of support. However, some of the things that are built within the Chicago uh, 
if you're a police officer within the city of Chicago, they're, they're there to sort of protect you from punishment, right? There's articles written within their contract in which they're informed when a, of the identity of the individual who's bringing forth a formal complaint that's filed against them and when they're being investigated. And that can be problematic because it makes it easier for that officer to retaliate, right? That's a community that you frequent and you're responsible for. You can go into these communities um, if you find out that someone has brought up a formal a complaint against you. Um, there's also a, a contract protecting the identity of the officer from the public. So if there's a, an officer that has several complaints or that you know has this huge um, you know, misconduct, it, it makes it harder for the general public to be made aware because any serious allegations uh, are, are not being made known. We don't know the identity of that officer and it completely circumvents their accountability. Officers are also able to sort of edit and correct their statements um, from given during a disciplinary hearing with the city of Chicago, right? It's in their contract with the written consent of the Federal Order of Police. So that also allows them to edit incriminating evidence or um, anything sort of that would allow them to escape consequences of their action, right? If, if they're allowed to do so. And that can be sexual misconduct, police brutality, killing of break and bound people in our communities. So the system is sort of designed to serve and protect those policing our community and not its residents. And that's to sort of mention the history, the connection of the history between the history of policing being tied to slave patrols um, within this nation's history. So one thing we sort of talk about within the grassroots reparations campaign is how a budget can be seen as a moral document. Right? What we choose to spend our money on, either as a nation or within organizations, speaks to our values. So in 2020 alone in Chicago, we spent over $1.76 billion on policing, but not nearly as much on family and supportive services, clean water, streets and sanitation, public health, or even um, affordable housing. So prison is far from the rehabilitative rehabilitative practices that, you know, it's, it was once labeled, we all know this, no one comes out rehabilitated, right? And people of color are disproportionately incarcerated compared to their counterparts. So what we try to build and promote within our organization is that culture of reparations, meaning divesting from systems and structures that continue to oppress and harm black people in our communities. We're familiar with the 13th Amendment, which is allowing this con uh, within the Constitution, the institution of incarceration to continue, right? It's, we encourage supporting Black-led organizations, like I said, in leadership, wealth just re redistribution and land, right? Being able to open to learning more politically um, education around social and racial justice issues. We actually offer a course on reparations. And we host Reparation Sundays, which allows us to share in ceremony in a sacred space um, with those interested in doing this work. So recently, HR 40, which is the bill that, um, that is looking to form a commission to study proposals related to um, reparations and what that would sort of look like the history of slavery. So we're organizing to, to kind of get people to get their local reps to sign on and support the bill. Um, we're partnering with several organizations that have been doing work as well, such as Coming to the Table, In Cobra, Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth, and you can sort of reach out and support their work locally, see what they're doing in your local community if you're interested in, in getting involved. And some other examples and things that we have seen is Georgetown and Brown University that's created a fund and provided preferred enrollment and money to the descendants of enslaved Africans from its early founders to who formerly owned slave, as well as the Catholic Church who committed to pledging $100 million in reparations to atone for slave labor. Um, so there's a ton that you can do no matter what your faith is. We, we are interfaith and we do um, sort of some whatever ethically um, your moral sort of compass is, um, but you have an obligation to walk in solidarity and right the wrongs of history by supporting reparations. And the time is now, right? It's, it's, it's overdue. And, this is your opportunity to, to take advantage of that. Thank you. Yes, and so um, Reparation Sunday, if you click on that link uh, there, it actually is taking place on Sunday, August 22nd. So we're in that repara preparation period between now, Juneteenth, and um, Reparation Sunday on August 22nd. And there's also on our website, the link for you to sign up for that as well.
Thank you, Latrice, uh, for that wonderful uh, presentation, very informative. And I would encourage you, well, all of you, to uh, join the Reparation Sunday uh, and uh, make sure you uh, get the link where you can get the Reparations Toolkit. We'll give you further uh, uh, information and guidance in terms of how you can uh, participate in Reparations Sunday.